this is a summer class, and I'm afraid that we have a lot of people on vacation, and the amount of work on the wall is a rather disappointing display of unfinished pieces. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time discussing the homework because not too much time was invested in the homework. And my psychiatrist tells me I needn't spend more time critiquing work than the student spent doing it. It's very important to realize that you have to measure by the pound here. Is this all one individual's work? And is it a, an, uh, an effort at sarcasm? What's going on here? Tell me what's going on here. Um, well, I had difficulty finding uh, a live plant, and so I looked online for uh, pictures, and I got um, a very nice picture of wild orchids, which I designed on Route 3, and unfortunately it wasn't finished. All right. Uh, we have a table with 60 plants on it. I don't know why you didn't take one of them. 70 plants, maybe. None, not many of which are growing very large, but they're all Syngonium species. They're all very nice. Uh, I'm going to ask you to... you have a camera with you here? Yeah. I'm going to ask you to take the best plant I have Put it up against the white wall, light it magnificently, set your camera on a tripod, take a series of photographs of it and take a series of close-ups with your macro lens of individual leaves. And in your spare time when you get back to SCAD in Georgia, I'm going to ask you to do this fully. And I'm going to ask you to give me scans and call me, and I'll give you a critique over the phone. But this is an extremely important assignment, and not to have done it any further than you have. If this were going to be your, your object, that's what you should have drawn. And these leaves should have been conceived of as three-dimensional twisted forms in space. So that in looking at some of the petals of that orchid, you saw that they were truncated sections of cones, cylinders, spheres. You'd have to give them some girth so that you could show that they have a volume or that they surround an imaginary volume. You want to get a good view of them. That's what I've been calling roadkill, as if a, a tire ran over it in the road and it was just flattened. I said you wanted to find good views so that all of the petals overlapped. So you can either do a single blossom or you can do one of my plants with the spirals running through the whole thing, radiating lines, do the whole nine yards, put it in a good golden section rectangle, use parallel intervals. This is who's here. Okay. Good for you, Andrew. This is pretty much the notional space because you're touching top and right side. Uh, what you didn't do was create a field. Though, although this touches, it touches everywhere. That's a notional space. You've got a couple of weeks before you go back to school. Why don't you treat the, the um, pot as if it's a two-dimensional elevation rather than a three-dimensional figure? And... Uh, I was hoping you could use what's now the notional space as, as the field. I began moving elements of the John thing away from it. So I could use it, but I can... All you have to do, all you have to do is continue this diagonal out. And that diagonal out. And take, if you wish, one root three segment from this root three. And add it to the top and it'll immediately enlarge everything proportionately. And once you get your grid going, you'll find that everything fits on top of what you have. Are you with me? Because you can make the same root three 
moved off to one side in a larger root 3, and all of these intervals should work, or at worst, require that you move them a little bit, but it won't be much, so that everything you've invested in this root 3 will work. What you need to do, however, and you haven't done it clearly enough, you have the two diagonals and you have the reciprocals, but what you didn't do is break this down into nine root threes by showing me how they broke down. And then you have one reciprocal here, you could have put the other one in, and you could have had this three root threes. And then you would have seen exactly what you were doing in each of them. Now, if you were to use that intersection, instead of making this the major division, made that the major division, you would find that this would be a root three on the theme of four. Can you see how it would be? Because this would go in twice to halfway and twice again, that would be four root threes. Now this is the same as root two on the theme of three or the root two on the theme of two. So you can do a root five on the theme of five or the root five on the theme of six. The root four on the theme of four or the root five, four on the theme of f five. Hmm? So that option obtained. You can always play games with it. I just found a, a drawing by Zuniga which I've been analyzing, and it looked like a root three on the theme of four. But everything was just a little funny. And then I discovered what he had done is he had used a root four, gave me the root four on the theme of four, but he had taken a half of a root four from the top and added it to the top of this horizontal. So it gave him a root four over almost all of the drawing except for this little piece that he put on the top, and he rebated the square in just the root four, and everything was on the square. And it was elegant, and I'd never seen anybody do that with a root four before. But for a while, because it was so close, I mean, it was 0 .037 smaller than a root three, which was nagging me, until I discovered that he wasn't using a root three at all, but it was very close to root three, and he was applying the root four. So the more you analyze, particularly in your case, since you're going to be a, an architect, have you analyzed any architecture this summer? Yeah. Who have you been analyzing? Uh, the last thing I looked at was Khan, a project in uh, Chestnut Hill, where Escher has. I've seen it. It has all the charm of a warehouse. That's <laughs> true. It's not an attractive building, but it's a little bit better than the Escher <laughs> cave in a tree. That's the funniest little place in the world. <laughs> Yeah, that's in Paoli, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty crafty, arts and crafty sort of stuff, but I, I, I really wasn't impressed. I guess I've had architects who studied with Khan at the University of Pennsylvania that feel that he's a god with two wives, I understand, two families, which is kind of nifty if you can do it. So let's see. Let's see what you've done. I'd like you to continue with it. These are not very characteristic. You have to be careful. Remember, I'm talking about aspective views. And if you are if you don't have them, it's going to really disfigure everything. And remember, Last week I talked about a witch elm in the southwest of England that was a specimen tree. Everything you're doing is really very good. The problem is you don't have, oh, you did enlarge this a bit, didn't you? There's a not much, not much. I like the radiating lines. I'd like you to put a three-dimensional box around that, put a cube around that pot so you can swing your ellipses because they're not reading. You didn't have a plane. Would you continue with it? 
gestures a little bit excessively curvilinear. Try and find something very simple, very, very simple. This, for somebody who's only had a couple of classes with us, is very good. Uh, you're a little too curvilinear, and one of the things you wanted to do and hadn't enough experience here to know about was if you're able to take the leaf and find straight line elements that you can run through the whole and repeat. It's a tremendous advantage. Do you see it? And if you can have coincidences running through here as well, that is an advantage. Then you can soften some of this and it is something that you can play against other elements where you're running parallels through the whole program. If these come from your rectangle, so let's say this is a root four, and this is giving you, this isn't a root four, but similar, all right? It's giving you the sinister reciprocal, it's giving you the Baroque reciprocal, it's giving you the Baroque diagonal, the sinister diagonal, Suddenly you have things to repeat along with your verticals and horizontals. So if you go back to giving a rigid straight line, the, the Chinese say every, every pot should have a bone. And what they're talking about is running all of these triangles. You see it. All of these triangles. So they have these intervals, and that means you can put them on the section. Hmm? And this straight line becomes the bone. It's smoothed out when they finally finish the piece, but it was very clearly designed with strong parallel intervals running through the whole program. So if we agree that uh, immediately we have verticals and horizontals from the rectangle, the sides and top and bottom, we have the diagonals of the rectangles and the reciprocals. Then we, we have the 45 degree of the rebated square. We have most of the directions that we're going to employ in our design. And when you start analyzing architecture and you start analyzing great graphic design, I recommend MUCA to you. If you're interested in architecture, I recommend um, Otto Wagner rather extraordinary figure who's not given much space in this country, but it's a shame because he had a profound influence on Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright and many, many others because he was asked by the emperor to redesign and design buildings and plazas and public spaces for the city of Vienna. And he put together a team of his students and they did a phenomenal job. Austria is a beautiful city, I understand. Uh, so who is doing this next one? This is uh, Brandon. Yes, sir. The arabesques are very nice. Very nice. Very fluid. You didn't... Good for you. This is too busy. You've made it too dark. It's a subordinate element, and you should be making it much lighter so that it doesn't overwhelm the whole. You've done awfully well. You have these spinning around. There's a suggestion that this is coming through. You've done the best piece on the wall, young man, all right? You're right. That's not bad for a 14-year-old, all right? Good for you. And this didn't get far enough in. There's some nice work, but it didn't get far enough. So. I'm glad I've made an appointment with my psychiatrist because I'm going to really need to address the problem of having such uncooperative, lazy students. But there we are. You've done plenty of work over the semester. I'm sorry that whatever came up came up this week and caused the show of work to be as thin as it is. 
and some of you didn't do anything at all, and you'll be visited by Guido late at night, and you won't even hear the floor creak. What goes around comes around. Tonight we're going to address the challenge of drawing a portrait. And I'm going to give you a slide illustrated introduction to the idea so that you can see that you will not be the first to draw a portrait. And the advantage of knowing that you're not the first to draw a portrait is that you have a great wealth of portraits to look at, which I think is an appropriate thing to do. It's been said many times that the museum is the art students and university. And when, at the end of the 18th century, artists at the beginning of the 19th century were no longer supported by the wealthy church, and the state wasn't commissioning that many paintings, sculptures, etc., it was starting to fall back, artists could no longer afford hordes of apprentices doing all of their commissions. And it became increasingly more difficult for students to get an education in art. Many publishers were hiring people to produce books on how to draw. It starts about this time. And the Bog series for Jerome that everybody walks around with under their left arm today, because under their right arm is drawing on the left side of the brain. So here they suddenly have a formulaic approach to drawing, both of which I think have nothing to do with the tradition, because Art is not about appearance. And both of those systems demand that you pay more attention to what you're looking at than what you know or design or the other aspects of drawing that make drawings more interesting than the view out of your window on a rainy day. So a lot of youngsters managed to get into a famous artist studio, which meant usually the artist showed up on Saturday for critiques, and all the students pitched in for money for the stove so that they could be warm, and they paid for the model, they pitched in money for the model, and the studio was free. And Whistler and Mucha shared a studio, Cremone had a studio, a lot of people in Paris had one because it was a prestigious thing to do and renting a studio wasn't very expensive, and you only had to spend a week, uh, uh, an hour on a weekend and do rounds and do a little critique and that was it. You were associated with a studio. The older students tended to teach the younger students, but all of them spent great amounts of time in the Louvre, in the major museums, copying masterworks. And you know that they were hoping that somebody would tap them on the shoulder and say, young man, how much do you want for that? Because they both learn a great deal about drawing, painting, and design, and color through the copying of masterworks, which is now a tradition among serious students and frowned upon by a lot of art teachers. Well, there's nothing personally creative about this. Why copy somebody else's drawing? Well, I wanted to understand how they used the golden section. I wanted to understand how they used all these systems of enclosures and passage, etc. And the teacher knows so little about drawing, they're upset that you're copying something. They think that's sort of plagiarism. So what we're having is a real loss of tradition because the whole system of learning how to draw was 10 years of copying every drawing in the master's closet, his contour. These were the secrets of the studio, and you had to master all of the drawings that this master had collected for years. One of the most famous contours that survived is Rubens. And they don't know whether Pennells, who did all the copies for him, was stealing industrial secrets or had been told by Rubens to copy all these pieces. But it is a secret cachet of drawings that all of the apprentices had to copy 
to learn how to draw. And they had to understand what they were copying, not just copy them like uh, a camera. They had to understand what the systems were, which is a great part of what we're doing here in the figure drawing classes. We want to understand how Michelangelo, Raphael, Picasso solved problems and how architects solve problems. And if you understand the procedures and the devices that they use, you stand half a chance of being creative, inventive, and doing things with some authority. So let's look at a series of images that will throw light on the whole tradition of portrait painting, drawing the human head, and seeing what goes on here. This is a, a Victorian plate from one of the how-to books. And what it's showing you is that you have a notional space, and the head consists of three nose lengths, and then an eye on top. That there is an, an eye here, 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 and there. This is a little wider. There should be five eyes across. Most heads conform to this geometry if you're looking at them full front, at eye level which you almost never do. But it's worth understanding the proportions of the head so that you can fix in your mind a prototype, a standard, a canon that you refer to no matter what the view of the head might be from the point of view you have in a classroom. I believe this is Gika from Gika, the Geometry of Art and Life, and he superimposed a grid on top of the head of a very famous tennis player, I think an English tennis player. And what we have is one, two, three, four here, and five eyes there. We have one nose, two, three, and then the eye at the top in a vertical position. What he's showing you is that the tear duct and the nostril coincide. The edge of the mouth coincides with the iris. You can bring this element down and you can break all of this down into a grid. Break this into a grid. Dura, in his Dresden sketchbook, played all kinds of games with proportion. And he was designing all of these heads on a golden section. And he was trying to find a standard for a, an heroic head. Leonardo did this. Michelangelo did this. Everybody did this. So he did side views, and he changed all sorts of relationships as he went through it. In some cases, he swung compasses for everything. In others, he stepped down. He wasn't doing cartoons. He was playing different kinds of design systems because he found them interesting. He found it very engaging. And this was the symbol for the golden section of division. Leonardo is setting up a model, a portrait. Again, the tear duct hits the edge of the nostril, falls at a certain point on the mouth and the chin. The iris on the inside hits the mouth. He's running lines from the other side. What you see here are the 45 degrees of the rebated square. So we have a diamond, and then we have a square, and we would have a diamond repeated through the whole program. And what we see is that if we analyze masterworks, they will teach us how to design a head, a building, anything. So here we have repeated diagonals running through the whole head. That's giving you a rhythm because the intervals between all of these diagonals set up intervals, set up tempo, set up a rhythm that is the equivalent of a throbbing heart within the chest of a human figure. And then all the verticals have been broken down and seen and all the horizontals are relating things. So we look at the bottom of the earlobe and we relate it to the other side. We want to see that this diagonal meets a common point and radiates out, and the top also relates. 
if you draw one ear and then later you, when you're working on the opposite side of the head, draw the other ear, you're not drawing at all. You're copying isolated pieces in, a, in an unrelated fashion. If you draw ears, if you draw eyes, if you draw the skull, both left, right, top and bottom, if you draw the nose rooted to a central vertical and you want radiating lines for all of these elements, so you're playing one side against the other, you're designing, you're seeing relationships. What you'll discover is the right eye bears little or no real relationship to the left in any of us, that the forehead doesn't point perfectly forward, nor does the nose or the mouth or the chin. You're going to discover we are asymmetric. Initially, in my classes, I want symmetry. I want you to measure so that I know you can see, you can organize, you can simplify, and you can relate everything on a butterfly symmetry. But later I want you to look at heads and see just how much distortion goes on and how only through distortion are artists able to be more expressive. So here is the, the grid that I asked you to see when I asked you to draw your first bottles. Only vertical and horizontal intervals are being employed. Later, you would make sure that all of them were on the golden section interval. You would make sure that all these horizontals were on golden section divisions. But initially, the implication is that the way these lines line up, you've got diagonals. You see it. There aren't any, but these eyes that have been stressed do line up on diagonal relationships. So here's a young student who transferred for a year to study with me. He was at Rochester Institute in Technology, and then he went back. He wanted to learn to draw, and he didn't feel he was getting the instruction there. And here was his next piece, a self-portrait, based on that grid. And now he's playing the relationships. It is introducing a bit of linear work. But the grid is still there. We see him playing back and forth and seeing the, that, that the ear is the same distance from the center on this side as it is on the other. He's got a means of constructing this head. Now he's introducing a triangulated system where everything is radiating from a common point. And boy, is this more dynamic than this one. Do you see it? Verticals and horizontals don't have any of the drama or power of the diagonal. This comes alive, very much more so. But the eyes are related, the ears are related, the nostrils, the mouth, either side of the neck. There's a great commonality here, and it's based on the fact that there are controls for every vertical, horizontal, and diagonal. This is designing. This is another young man, Christopher Hensel, went on to the academy, won the traveling scholarship, went to India. When he got there, he realized he spent all of his money just getting there, and he spent very little time cycling around the country. But you can see all of this is based on radiating lines and triangulation, and it has an intensity, coupled with the way he's looking down at us, that uh, has a greater power than it would be if he didn't relate everything on this system of triangles. Yes? Is he doing the same thing with the neck that Sargon does with the, uh, with the head? Of oh, the young athlete? I'll be showing it later, yes. Yeah, it's the same thing. And here, Brandon is doing a variety of views using these systems and Really, he's done very well. He's now a graphic designer in New York City, and I understand he's doing well there as well. So there's no limit to what you can do, and this is also different from that straight view of the head. None of that really obtains. But you have to start someplace, so this gives you a canon, and it served Dura too. It served everybody well. Lebrun was asked by the king to prepare plates so that artists could communicate human expression and emotion. So he stylistically showed us, this is fear, he showed us love, jealousy, all of the human emotions in highly stylized, measured heads. Because the students of the king's academy were going to have to celebrate 
strong emotions in the biblical and classic stories that they illustrated that were so popular in the 17th and 18th centuries. So Lebrun created the text for human expression. And it's still usable. If you're doing a self-portrait, if you're doing a self-portrait or a portrait of a sitter, and you want, because you sense certain things about their emotional attitudes, their character, you can introduce distortions that suggest anxiety, interest, fear, worry. It's fascinating when you look at great portraiture to see how much of the personality of the sitter is revealed by a great portrait painter. So if you're rude and you think that your fellow resembles a pig, you will understand the things you can do to emphasize those characteristics. You know, there are shapes in nature that you can bring in that also can be emphasized because they create a relationship. Here, Rubens is showing you how to design a Hercules. He says, Hercules is a king, so too is a lion. So let's go to the lion and let's use the features of the lion in designing this vast, powerful, mythical figure. Same system approached as in the Lebrun. And here's Lebrun giving you a man-lion, I think much less successfully, but nonetheless it's the same system. And the two-dimensional figures of triangulation are being employed to contribute to that emphasis. And certainly they're here as well. If, if this is a highly stylized, simplified view of the human skull by Bames in his text on anatomy. And it's what I think is probably the best artist text on anatomy that one can find. Unfortunately, the only, the only editions that are worth getting are in German. But it's still worth getting. He stylized zygomatic arch. He's turned the, the front of the mouth into a cylinder. Everything is simplified and formalized, but it allows you to see what the forms underlying the skin really are. Then he breaks it down into separate elements. These are student drawings, but you see how the skull, the zygomatic arch, orbicularis oris, and all of this, the spaces in the skull, are oriented. But again, you're working with a centerpiece, yes. Bames, B-A-M-M-E-S, Godfrey Bames. <coughs> this is from Peck's Anatomy, and here you have all of the Latin names for all of the muscles. And the face is unusual in an anatomical terms because in most situations with anatomy, a muscle, for instance, like the bicep, will be attached to your upper arm bone, the humerus, and it will bring the lower arm, the radius up when it contracts. On the back of your arm, you have the tricep, which when it contracts, will extend your forearm. Brachial radialis will cause it to radiate, the forearm to radiate, to bring the radius over the ulna bone. But in the face, these muscles are connected to the flesh so that you can make expressions. Sure, the masseter, this big one, is connected to the zygomatic arch and the mandible, and it's one of the strongest muscles in the body, and you can crack nuts with your teeth because of the strength of this, and you can crack your teeth if you bite down hard enough. It's not a very good exercise, and I wouldn't recommend it, but it is, along with your buttock, one of the strongest muscles in the body. I don't tell your mother I told you that, but it's true. On the other hand, this orbicularis oris allows you to open and close your mouth to make expressions with your mouth. Others cause you to wrinkle up your brow. Robert Beverly Hale does a lecture on the human face and he 
illustrates it by pretending that he is the stewardess on an aircraft that's hitting turbulence and is afraid that the plane is going to crash. And she's telling you that all is well, but in, in every instance he's wrinkling up all of the fear and anxiety muscles, and it's a very entertaining play on facial anatomy. But you can see all of these muscles around the eye allow you not only to open and close the lids, but to squint and look very angry. Bridgman, on the other hand, reduces the head to a series of boxes. It's cubic. And he simplifies everything in simple planes, which is something I would recommend that you learn, and Bridgman's complete figure drawing is the place to learn it. It's not expensive, it's generally available, it's been in common domain for a long time, so people don't charge a whole lot for it. But Bames and everybody else include it in their bibliography because he's made a major contribution to simplifying something as complex as the human figure and its anatomy. This is Rubens teaching his students how to create the illusion of movement. This is his Hercules, which we saw him developing earlier. Remember Rubens, Michelangelo, and some of these Renaissance artists were creating heroic figures, figures out of the great myths and, and fables, figures who move mountains, figures like Christ in the Last Judgment, who isn't New Testament at all. He raises his hand to smite the damned, and Mary, his mother, cowers behind him as he stands there, a weightlifter from Gold's Gym. Massive, massive creature. Adam in the Sistine Ceiling and God are heroic figures. So these figures were intended to be massive examples of muscle culture, power, authority, intelligence. In the case of this piece, he's, he's made the beard a box scene from below, the head a box scene from above. Well, the head tips forward and the beard tips back. And when you shift your view from the top to the bottom, look at me, the head goes up and down. Do you see it? So you look at the top, the head goes forward. You look at the beard, the head goes back. So he's saying, since the viewer can only look at one plane at a time, in shifting their view from one to the other position, the illusion of movement is achieved. Not because the drawing moves, but because the three-dimensional solids shift. This is Dura, the German artist, hallucinating. The artist has to pretend that the head breaks down into planes. It doesn't really, it's all smooth. It is so valuable to be able to imagine the flat plane of the forehead, the down plane of the, of the brow, the planes on the eye protruding, the front of the face and the side of the head, the steps as you go down from up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way through. So if the light is coming from above, you have dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light, which is a rhythm. So you have up, down, you have dark light, and you have the light coming from the 45 degrees side, which was the Rembrandt lighting. It allows you to create a greater illusion of a projecting three-dimensional solid than if you simply copied what you found in a photograph that was poorly lit. So here, all the planes, now this is the Maggie from Duchamp Fillon. His brother was Jacques Fillon. These were Cubists, and they were in the 40s, 30s, and 40s in Paris. And we have a copy of this by one of our earlier students, and then these are the drawings he did before he made it in plaster. But you see how a Cubist can break things into all of these related forms and organize this on ellipses and radiating lines from triangles. And again, this is all a sweeping game of ellipses and arabesques. And you'll find that that diagonal comes up and hits this point and hits the eye at that point and comes up to that change of direction here. So all of these lines come through and coincide. Everything relates. It isn't just a matter of putting a mark down, they're looking something at something else to mark that down. 
So if you can imagine all these planes, what you have is a discrete brush stroke at each point. You, you have from one to two, you'll have a value change. If you're painting from one to two, you'll have a temperature change. One in the shadow will be cool, and in the light it will be warm. As you move into the shadow, it'll get cooler. As you hit the light again, it'll get warmer. So you're not only alternating light, dark, light, dark, but you're alternating warm, cool, warm, cool. And since color can be intense or neutral, it's alternating strong, weak, strong, weak. All of this is rhythm. All of this is variety. All of this is going to enrich the quality of your work. Where if you're only copying what you see, and you say a red apple is red, you've missed the point. So if we go back 2,000 years to a Greco-Roman mosaic, we see these people understood that you've got to imagine planes, and every one of these little tessellated pieces of faience style that's been fired and glazed has been placed down as one of these planes, just as the painter would have placed touches to establish the pyramidal form of the nose, this diamond shape here, this, the truncated cylinders, not cylinders, but hemispheres for the nostrils, we could turn everything into platonic solids. And we must, because we have to create the illusion of the third dimension on a two-dimensional surface. And to do that, we can't copy a photograph because a photograph is flat. We have to bring enough information to our subject, enough knowledge, to know how to emphasize and create the illusion of a three-dimensional solid around which there's a kind of air that Degas said isn't the air we breathe, it's the kind of space you expect to find in a painting. And to do that, you have to lie. You can't draw what you see. You've got to learn what works and what has worked for the past 2,000 years. And this 2,000-year-old mosaic has a hemisphere for a chin, a pyramid for the nose, the steps for the upper lips, and it's the brow, and the brow is casting a shadow over the eyes, and the light on the lower lid is eliminating the white of the eye, it's merging with it. Very clever. It, it looks like something out of the Vanderpool eyes and I asked you to copy. So when we're reticulating a bottle in drawing one, we're learning how to fracture a smooth, surface into a series of flat tessellations that represent planes angled in different directions. This is a student work and it's not perfect. The student stopped at the halfway point. But this line would have continued around here and we would have had another turning plane. And this would have turned around, we would have had another turning plane here and this would have turned around, and this would have turned around, and we might have had a couple of planes to make it across. Do you see, this is fuller than that because it doesn't carry around. See what I'm saying? So you remember when we did the sphere, we had this, and then that came out here, and it went out there. Remember? Well, that's what this student forgot to do, carry it out to the edge. But he's been punished, don't worry. Alberto Giacometti is famous for his gesture drawings of the human head, in which he draws at thousands of miles a minute. The gestures are really violent. In this, it seems he said, I'm going to challenge the great Egyptian sculpture of Nefertiti. I'm going to represent this as magnificently as I possibly can. I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to make it as bold and as refined as that famous portrait of that Egyptian queen. So, he, he reverts to the simplest of geometries. The brow comes here and the hair is formalized into this lock. He comes down here and he breaks this down into 
a series of changes. Do you see it? And this now relates to that, and these planes come forward, and these planes come forward, and when he comes down here, he comes to the diamond at the end of the nose, the nostril, the philtrum, the upper lip, the lower lip, these stages that come down this way, everything is truncated into the simplest form imaginable. Do you see it? Just planes. The sculptor needs to understand how to render everything as a series of planes. Because by overcutting them, making them deeper than he actually sees them, he can articulate the play of light over the surface of his forms. So he too has to learn to exaggerate. If you look at the portraits by Rodin and many of the great Renaissance sculptors, you'll see they dig in much more deeply than is the case with the human head because it wants to produce a kind of drama, a kind of power as the light plays across it that wouldn't exist if you simply copied what you saw. And this is why we study masterworks, to learn the games of excess that they develop to make their work stronger than real life. This planal head is a standard art school problem, and this young student won about $60,000 for this drawing when you consider that it was in a portfolio that got him into a fine art school with a lot of money. Back when $60,000 amounted to something, today its equivalent would be about $120,000. The cost of art schools has gone up. This year we won three hundred and what, $46,000? $346,000 just this year, and the total now is in excess of $4 million. We've been waiting to break through that $4 million mark for a couple of years, and I'm announcing it in the paper shortly with great pride. Hmm? Here is a computer rendering of the head as a mosaic of Cartesian squares. So the computer is now being structured to apparently think the way the human mind does. Because if we can't throw this grid of squares over every object, we can't show the third dimension. We can't reticulate it into all these fractured planes. With this device of this net, we can describe smoke, clouds, water, wind, flowing hair, the surface of a body. We can find rectangles to make touches of paint with, but we have to know how to articulate it. We have to know how to fracture it. This is a drawing from Harold Speed's The Practice and Science of Drawing, which I require as a text for this course. Now, let's look at what his lines represent. Those lines did not exist in the model. They were forced as a requirement for describing form. Let me show you what I mean. This represents a plane coming here. This down to that point reps a plane there. This represents a plane coming in here. And now we have the eye with the iris, the white, and this would be the bottom lid's upper edge. All right? This now represents a plane here, and this would represent a plane there, and this now is coming down to here, and then we're going to move around for the nostril. So that every time he sets up a line, he's setting up a plane. Do you see what he's up to? Every single line is doing that. This becomes the edge of the mandible. This drops in. This comes over here. Here he's coming here, then we're going back to set up the chin. So in every instance, his line represents a plane. Got it? His line represents a plane. So he's deviating from what he sees, though when he's done, if this were a portrait commission, the subject would recognize themselves but it's been transposed into an image that will look volumetric 
on a flat surface. That is the challenge. This is Pablo Picasso. I assume he's about 15 or 16 years old. He's drawing, once again, a sister, whom he drew continually. She was handy and probably fairly cooperative. So we're coming to this. So we have a plane here. Like and as in the Giacometti, we have this form, this three-dimensional form sticking out. This is coming down. Then we're coming to the edge of the nose. We're coming down here with a nostril. And we're coming through here to create the mouth. Then we're coming down here and here. And there's a break. The eyes would be here. Let me put that in. Do you begin to see what he's up to? Absolutely everything is a plane. See what he's up to. That's a transposition. That is not exactly what he saw, but it's the best way of representing what he did see. So we never copy what we see. Nobody ever did, except Sunday painters. And untrained students who aren't being taught anything about drawing because they don't know what to do, so all you do is copy it, as if it were trying to reproduce it as a photograph. And it's as flat as a photograph. This is the young architect, Rudy Ellert, doing a portrait in overlapped root fives. I believe it's a Pythagorean rectangle. And it's fully reticulated. And every single linear element's locked into the grid. Radiating lines, parallel verticals, horizontals. He's using the the diagonal of this sinister diagonal of this recta old rectangle, he's repeating it all the way through here. He's taking this Baroque, he's carrying it through all the way through the program. He's taking this through as a reciprocal all the way through the program. You find that your gambit comes from the grid. You choose your rectangle because of the diagonals and their angles because they suit your subject. The subject comes first. This young lady won the first full scholarship to Pratt when I first opened the studios. She's now a graphic designer and a mother and doing extremely well. So she won a full tuition scholarship to Pratt. This is what Ian was referring to as a highly triangulated drawing by John Singer Sargent. Notice he's not copying the eyes. He's putting down smudges that read as the planes around the eye, the lids, the light falling on that lower lid. Everything is stylized. The catch light that he introduces into the eye on this side, but not that. And everything is a triangle. Everything is a triangle. This goes all the way up and comes down. The mouth is a whole series of triangles. The nose is a series of triangles. The ears are related on these references. He's trained. He's trained. He lights the figure from in front and above. So he has the change of light, dark, light, dark, coming down the middle of the face. And the young man looks powerful. He looks athletic. He's a young Italian. And that great triangular neck going spreading out the way it does make him look, makes him look as if he's just fresh from Gold's Gym also. And here's Giacometti drawing so rapidly with a rigor in paint and drawing only relationships, only triangles, only horizontal and vertical lines. He is building a design. And he has calipers, so all of these are golden section divisions on top of everything else. This is John Singer Sargent again, and unlike the strong two-dimensional triangular right-angle relationships we found in the men, in drawing this beautiful young society woman, he's playing with arabesques. And look at the fluidity of that line. Look at the way he flows through and connects everything. Hmm? The shoulder goes through the back of the hair and comes through the far side on this side. It just is a wonderful way of getting everything to flow perfectly. And it's subterranean. 
And if you don't study these drawings, if you just glance at them, you wonder at their genius. If you remember what Michelangelo said, he said, if, if you only knew the trouble I went to learn my craft, you wouldn't think it was marvelous at all. These people had to work. They had to learn. You're not born with this information. I'm repeatedly saying you can draw an apple all you want. It will not teach you how to draw. The apple doesn't know how to draw. Somebody has to teach you how to draw an apple. So Giacometti again, playing with enclosures, playing with right angle relationships, building ahead. Continuing, building everything off that central vertical. And when sculptors sculpt, they continually redraw that central vertical because it's everything against that that's being played as a right angle, a 45 degree, or what have you. This is all Giacometti. So it's interesting. What looks like the height of abstraction is as straightforward an analytical drawing as you could find. There are distortions and elongations and exaggerations, sure. But you can, you can see the logic of what he's doing because we've been dealing with this geometry from the moment we started talking about the head. This was done by a 14-year-old girl who came to me from California when she was 12. She lived in this building all by herself for two years. She came back three or four years ago in her mid-30s interviewing at the University of Pennsylvania and some of the other colleges because she decided now she wants to be a doctor. I haven't heard what happened. But it's exquisite the way she has rendered this. This is Giuliano de' Medici from a cast we got from Geist. Every one of these curls is in a box. Can you see it? What Michelangelo did was he translated every one of these curls into a box that was fixed to the head. So this came down like this, and all of the boxes fit into that. Do you see what he's up to? Each one of them fits into that. And he turned them into cylinders. Do you see it? So this is here, but it's this. So we have dark shadow, half tone, and light, and then this is shadow, light, etc. So he's following the skull and he's popping these things off the skull so they turn away as the head rolls. Got it? Look at the reflected light under the nose and the upper lip, the thickness of these lids, the light falling on the bottom lid. The, this is called the sausage because it looks like a sausage. Hmm? People have been doing this for a long time. Wouldn't it be nice to know what they're doing and understand what they're doing so that you too can do it? Hence, you copy masterworks. You analyze them on the golden section. You translate them into simple three-dimensional solids. You work with a Rembrandt lighting. So you've got this triangle of light here. This is in light. You, you draw this with that. You draw the jowl with this. You draw that with this. Do you see what's going on? This is a perfect triangle. This comes up and drops into that. This comes to this point and drops down. If this comes over to the center line, as I said, there's a reverse curve in the Michelangelo. These are some of the things you're going to do. Now, tonight what you're going to do is you're going to sit opposite each other and you're going to draw each other. And you're going to enjoy it enormously. But I'll tell you what I want you to do, all right? So here's J.J. DJ Zaccanini doing a very, very careful sketch, rendering. Very carefully designed on the section, very carefully rendered in uh, Conte on Ang paper. He really, really mastered all of this. Then he went to the University of the Arts and he forgot it all. This is Claudia Rilling, who's now studying for her master's in painting in California, in San Francisco at the Academy. You can see how powerful these are because of the systems that they're employing. The intensity here is a byproduct of organization, of understanding. Skills grow on a basis of understanding, not on ignorance. 
So here's a young student drawing. And when you get up close, you can see all of the reference lines that allows her to play one eye against the other, the tear duct with the nostril, all the shapes in the mouth. These people know what they're doing. They have been taught to draw. And here's Picasso working from a plate from Jerome in the Bog drawing how to do it book. We have it here. And he's analyzing the straight line elements which represent the planes that he's going to discuss and the way he renders it on the right. It is an absolute copy of a plate. And this was how everybody learned to draw. You bought the Jerome text, all these plates, and if you look in art books, they'll say, this drawing was done from the antique by Seurat. Nonsense. It was done from one of those printed plates of the Jerome drawing book created by Bog for Jerome. Picasso copied them. Lautrec, Van Gogh, just about everybody who learned to draw in the 19th century copied the Jerome system. So it's nice to have it, but the drawings are lifeless. They're dead. Jerome's work was dead. So here's Hambid showing you how to take a rectangle and how to use the diagonals of that rectangle to create a gamut. So, I don't know what this rectangle is. It's 1.5. It's a square and a half. So it should have overlapped fours in it, which is the way we order it, but never mind. This is the diagonal of the rectangle, and it's repeated in all of these situations. Do you see it? It's repeated here. This is the sinister diagonal. It's repeated in the nose, the forehead. It's repeated here. It's repeated parallel to that as we come down here. We have horizontal lines at these points. These are all horizontals. That's a horizontal. This now is parallel to this reciprocal, so we'll start looking for that direction to be repeated through the whole. <clears throat> this is the, uh, this isn't a reciprocal, this is the other diagonal, and we've got verticals, all right? So look at how quickly we've got ahead with just a few directions. The fewer directions you use, the more powerful your drawing. The more directions you use, the more confused and fussy the drawing. Great artists can draw only that which is significant, that which is aspective, that which is essential. They don't get confused by irrelevant details. Cate Besson, the great photographer, the great French photographer, says the amateur, the Sunday painter, is overwhelmed, is tyrannized by details. They're afraid to leave anything out. They don't know what's important. They don't know what's irrelevant. They don't know how to edit. Somebody's got to teach you how to edit. I am your friend. I will teach you how to edit. So here is a portrait of a young man by <clears throat> Vincent van Gogh. The young man is a peasant. Van Gogh lived among the peasants in Holland. He wanted to be a parson, he wanted to be a preacher, and the officers of his church were offended that he lived with these dirty, illiterate, peasants. Very often they had to wait for somebody to die to get something warm to wear. They were poor. They suffered from malnutrition. A bad harvest, they were doomed to starvation. This is all during the Little Ice Age. We don't hear about it because everybody's talking about global warming. Global warming was a good thing. The ice sheets retreated. More land could be cultivated. 
the summers were longer. During the, the Little Ice Age, the summers were short. The ice came down from the mountains in the form of glaciers. There was less arable land. Crops rotted in the earth. It was so wet. Nothing grew. There was more death, plague, and misery from the 13th to the end of the 19th century than anyone can imagine. The plague crossed back and forth across the whole world, year in, year out. But the moment at the end of the 20th century, at the 19th, end of the 19th century, when it started to warm up, <coughs> some places could have three crops where before they couldn't get one out of the earth. Populations increased, health increased, people were sitting around in small hovels close to one another, suffering malnutrition, and in smoky little houses, sharing all the germs and dying. It wasn't such a good idea. So during warm periods, and every 15 year, 1,500 years, we have a cycle of warm and then a cycle of cold. This is a peasant. This is a root three rectangle. What I have done is I have introduced the Baroque diagonal and the reciprocal hitting it at 90 degrees. Where it intersects, it gives me a vertical that touches the hat and the front of the iris. It gives me the corner of the mouth and the corner of the chin. As it comes down, it hits the eyebrow and it hits here and bounces and gives me the bottom of, bottom of the eye. Where it hits the diagonal again, it gives me this peak. And where it hits this, it gives me that point on the hat, all right? I could bring that down again, again too, it'd give me the front of the, or the back of the mouth. So this one line gives me all this pertinent information. What it does is it places the most important feature of the human head, the eye, on a major division of a root three, on the theme of three, because that's a root three. Now let me continue, all right? Let me continue. But let's notice that that diagonal gives me the neck, the chin, the lower lip. It gives me the eye, the brow line. It gives me this portion of the hat. It gives me that, this, and this. It gives me these similar diagonals, okay? It's my gambit. Here's the sinister diagonal that strikes the back of the head, the ear, and the, this collar of the sweater. It repeats itself through here all the way through the figure. Do you see it? This is deliberate, this isn't accidental. This isn't a coincidence, but we call them coincidences. This is on the rebated square, and the 45 degree angle is giving us the edge of the mouth, it's giving us the ear, and it's giving you this point as it comes down. This 45 is going through the air, ear, and it's giving, this, uh, giving us the 45 degree wherever it shows up. These are the Baroque diagonals and their coincidences. So the neck coincides with the bottom of the eye, with the brow and, that, and the peak, peak of the cap. This division comes through and hits the, 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 this top of the hat. This comes down and hits the ear and comes down. We can take all of these through. So there's a sense that Van Gogh is making these kinds of mocks as he works across the figure. When I was at the Ruskin at Oxford, my drawing master used to say, Percy Horton used to say, draw across the form, in which case he meant draw your parallel intervals across the whole form. These are just the horizontal, so he's drawing that with the mouth. He's drawing this with the ear, and it's falling at a point on this. This is coming through. This is coming through and hitting the iris. Do you see it? The back and the front, the left and the right, are all being played through. He's running all of his horizontals the way he drew the other directions. Here are the vertical intervals and the coincidences. So this point on the chin, the mouth, the front of the iris, the front of this portion of the cap, all around a coincidence. He can take this through from the mandible to the earlobe to the top of the ear to a point on the hat. This follows all the way through the arm. So these are the directions coming from his grid. Here, Hambidge again showed you, I think it's Dr. Ross doing this, and you'll have this direction running through the whole program. You have your verticals. You have your verticals here. This diagonal is coming through over and over again, and it's simply the way you simplify, simply the way you formalize, simply the way you bring unity, rhythm, to what you're doing. 
This is what the Bresson photographs are all about, because he was trained to draw. This is uh, Christopher Parrott doing a portrait from a model here at the studios in a Pythagorean rectangle, which has overlapping fives, so it's inevitable that the diagonals of the five are going to play an important part. So this is the Baroque, and this is, this is the sinister. So we see the nose, the forehead, this, that, the back, this is the Baroque coming through this, etc. A couple of verticals, very few directions. It has real power, much stronger. Then distortion, exaggeration in El Greco. Imagine trying to communicate something about a person who has seen God or the archangel Michael. Somebody who has had a revelation, a religious revelation, and is experiencing the ultimate in ecstasy. They're twisted all out of shape. Nothing is regular. How else could you do it? Many of these figures, saints going up to, to heaven, are so distorted by the, the sense of ecstasy that the artist has tried to imbue them with, that if you'll excuse the expression, it's obviously the closest that human beings come to that kind of ecstasy, and it happens to be an orgasm. And it's deliberate. It's absolutely deliberate. Where else are you going to find that degree of excitement and loss? Incredible. Michelangelo does a self-portrait, and Rubens copied it. Both of them could draw. This eye looks up, this eye looks down. The mouth looks to the left, nose looks to the left, this looks to the right, and so does the forehead. Everything is twisted out of shape because it is full of anguish. The man's miserable. Van Gogh plays these games. His anguish is something he can express only through extreme distortion. And then here is Lucian Freud, Sigmund Freud's grandson. Now a very old man, I believe in his late 80s or early 90s, still blindly driving his old Rolls Royce all over London. He looks in the mirror and he sees decay, the passage of time, the depth of the wrinkles in his face. He contemplates his own mortality. How to express it? The forehead looks to the right, these eyes look to the left, the nose to the left, the mouth to the right, the chin to the left. The cheeks are looking to the, our right, the forehead's looking to our right, but the eyes are looking to our left. Everything is shifting. Everything is twisted. Everything's going in a different direction. Do you see it? The intensity of anger, anguish, worry, fear. How do you express those things? As if you were taking a photograph of a young person for the yearbook in the high school graduation? For 1995 with a lot of wallet-sized prints? No way! That isn't going to do it. Smile. That isn't going to do it. You've got to have ways of communicating strong feelings, and you won't get it if everything simply looks like everything. And this is Kruger, the German caricaturist. He's using photorealistic techniques to emulate hair. Brilliant painting. The, the, the mouth is wet. It's even dripping. Hmm? Grossly distorted. How well this is done. He knows what's important. Everything is more contrasty here than anywhere else. He's got aerial perspective working. He's got keynote. He's got zone one, zone two, zone three. Very, very clever. And the photorealistic treatment of, of, of flesh and the wet mouth is enough to make your skin crawl. Look at all these wrinkles. My God. <clears throat> He's very good. He's really, really very good. Francis Bacon uses distortion. 
every brushstroke is an arabesque, these huge brushes, and he presses, he presses terry cloth and corduroy into them to get these patterns, and he lets them dry. And, uh, well, I don't want to discuss him. He did a lot of lying. He's a very clever designer and a brilliant painter. His story isn't one that's very, very attractive, however. So Lebrun shows you how to express feeling with the expressions of the eyes and forehead. Does a wonderful job. If you can manipulate the human face with this degree of authority, imagine how much psychological insight you can in infuse into a portrait of some sitter or some character in a painting. Look what he does with the eyes of animals. They're marvelous. I don't want to meet this one in the dark, all right? Now, they, these are, this is a fairly friendly dog. See, he, he figures you're going to give him that piece of meat or he'll take your hand. But, but you know, it's, it's marvelous what you can do if you understand something about the anatomy and what to emphasize and what to diminish, what to stress, what's important, what's irrelevant. Don't include it. So, Rudy Ellett comes and he starts to measure. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to look at each other and I want you to begin to see what the notional space of the head is. I want you to measure the width into the length and make a square and whatever additional portion there is. I want you to find the center line and I want you to see how many times the nose measures into the hole and where an eye falls. I want you to measure the eyes across, and we've got one, two, three, four, five. And then I want you to start triangulating the nose, the cheeks, but I want the horizontal line where that value, where that direction change goes, so you can come in with a different triangle. I want you to draw the ears together. I want you to draw the sides of the head together. I want you to find controls for the left and the right, even if the left and the right are different. Where on the center line for the eyes? The center line, you'll, you'll uh, allow me to say without feeling offended, will be in the center. Okay? Just the middle of your notional space. Because the two of you are facing each other, all right? So you're getting a front view. If you get a three dimensional view, not a three dimensional view, if you get a three quarter view, then it becomes more problematic. But this is a highly stylized, straightforward rendering of a front view of a human head, and almost all human heads conform to the three noses and an eye, the five eyes across, etc. All right? So I'm giving you the easiest approach. I am your friend. So having done this, he moves on to this. It took him probably 40 self-portraits over seven months. Then he starts with value. He's starting with a turning head now. This is where he ends up. It's really brilliant. Young architect, probably about 40 years old now. He's just broken off on his own, opened his own shop. He's got a very good reputation in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is a very high-end venue for architects. They only tend to get 20, 30 million dollar estates to design. The firm he works with is incredibly wealthy and they have about a five year waiting list for people who want them to design their homes. And when they start building a home, it usually takes three or four years before it's finished because everything is manufactured bespoke. Carpenters have to build all of the windows and all of the inlays. Nothing is four by five straight out of Home Depot. There, you can look at, Rudy, you can look at, at our website and look at the houses that have been designed by Doug Pat. He worked for the same architectural firm in Greenwich, and you'll see the houses that he and Rudy designed. And then here's a piece of distortion. Everything that measured one by one, he made one by one and a half high. This is how you distort. This is how El Greco distorted. This is how Michelangelo distorted. You knew what it measured, but you altered it. It could be one by one and a half wide. 
could be one by two wide, depending on the degree of distortion we want to employ. So those who will start in portraiture with me in the fall and September will start measuring this head because it doesn't move. And the live model presents all kinds of problems. The live model presents all kinds of problems. This is a wonderful figure to draw. It served a lot of students handsomely in their quest to learn how to work. And if you look carefully, you'll see it's all straight lines. People don't use curves, not artists. Amateurs use curves. Artists tend to use all straight lines. They fit on the grid. They can be measured. How do you grab a curve? It's like overcooked spaghetti. So that's an overview. We've gone from Dura. We've gone from Greco-Roman mosaicists to Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud. I didn't show you any Picasso, but he's very famous for his portraits. So what I want you to do is I want you to I want working off the central vertical, knowing that you're going to divide this into three noses and an eye. And I want you to measure it. And I want you to say that this measures one by one and a half. So that's a 1.5 rectangle. You want to find where the center is. That's where you're going to place the eyes. OK? You check it. You'll find all of these heads are pretty much identical. Some people will be a little bit different. But you ignore it. Keep it easy. So you decide what the eye is that you're going to carry through. And you tear a piece of paper and you mark the eye on it. So you can measure each one to make sure it's true. Don't do it with a sighting stick or a pencil because there will always be errors in that. But the mock paper is reliable. Then measure the nose and put that on your piece of paper. So you make sure that these are all identical. Then start sighting. How far down does this come? And you can measure this and you can say it's one nose to here. You can run this through. You can run the nostrils through. You can run the ears through. Are you with me? Then you can come through, and from a point up here, you can start to come down here. You're drawing the ears there, and you're finding out where this ear breaks on that one. You've got the nostrils. You can start building all the triangles that you're going to find here. You can start building all the triangles that you're going to find in the mouth. And you're going to start coming into the chin again from that center line. Are there any questions? You're going to measure everything. You're going to cite everything. If you're polite, you could even take a measuring stick. Uh, what we've done is we've set up <coughs> donkeys for you to sit at. And I'm going to ask each of you to sit across from somebody else. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I think we've got enough. I'll ask all of you to try. OK, so Sarah, you and Jess, Dino, let's sit down and see what we can do. Pose, please. Let's go.